Before we jump in to our, our message today, uh, we always want to greet our friends that are joining us at Riverbend Maximum Security and D. Berry and the Tennessee Prison for Women. Come on, church family, let's welcome them. We're glad that you guys are along for the ride. We are in week one of a series, and actually it's not even really a series, it's a book study. Uh, for those of you that have been around Connect for any length of time, maybe you've been with us from the beginning, you know that at least one time a year we take a book of the Bible and we just go line by line, verse by verse through that book. And uh, normally we go through a four to six week series and that's around a theme or a topic. This is not that. Um, I actually love this way of studying scripture. I think it's the most, probably the most effective way to learn Scripture. Uh, I love it because uh, I don't have to come up with the points. Um, the Bible uh, is the point. And um, so rather than finding Scripture to address a certain topic, we just take the topics that the Bible throws at us and we address it and we talk about it and we uh, make sure that it's interpreted through the lens of, uh, of the, the, the accurate way of how to interpret Scripture and um, cross-referencing it. And we'll do a lot of that throughout this, this study. We're studying the book of First Peter. I think it's important for us to first understand that the Bible is not a book about self-discovery. It's a book about God discovery. And in our learning and discovery of God and the nature of who he is, we then experience self-discovery. I discover who I am as a result of discovering who he is. So my, my self-discovery is a byproduct of God discovery. Because there can be no true knowledge set apart from the knowledge of God and who he is. So how, how do we gain knowledge and understanding of God? Well, primarily through his word and through the Holy Spirit revealing truth to us. And so anytime we begin a new book study, I mean, if you've been from here from the beginning, you know, we, we've gone through the book of James and Galatians and Ephesians. Uh, last year, we actually did two book studies. We went through the book of 1 John, if you remember. We went through the book of, J of um, Daniel last year. And so this year, we're going we're gonna to try to approach uh, 1 Peter for the next, I don't know how many weeks. The, the team always knows that there's a rough number of weeks, and it just depends on how much we get through, because we're so committed to looking at the text. But um, the reason I, I want to make sure we take our time is because context is really important when you're studying Scripture uh, I want you to imagine, if you will, receiving a letter in the mail, and uh, the, the envelope is handwritten, but you don't glance at who it's from or the return address. Instead, you rip open the envelope, you flip to the second page of the letter, and you read a couple paragraphs of it, and then you set it down. Now, knowing that the, the letter was important enough for your friend to send it to you, you know that you should respond in some way, and it may even require you to do something. So you spend a few minutes trying to think about how you should respond only based upon the small section that you read. And you're thinking, what did they mean by that? Now, none of us would, would read a letter like that, but a lot of us read our Bible like that. We skip past the envelope and we rip it open and we read a couple paragraphs and we never ask, like, who wrote this and to whom was it written and when was it written? Where was it written? What was happening? What were the circumstances around it being written? This is why book studies are so important for us in the life of our church. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll learn how to study scripture more effectively, the motivation behind it, how to apply it to our lives and the Bible is challenging enough without context. So it's putting it in with a context that, that helps us. What did they intend? What are they really trying to say here? What, what's God trying to say to me? What perspective is this coming from? So that I can ask the question, what am I supposed to do with this? When we study scripture, let me just teach you this before we jump into 1 Peter. There's three components of how we study scripture. Uh, first of all, we've got to have comprehension. How many remember uh, on the assessment test, they had the reading comprehension section and you had to read this long story and then they would ask you questions to see if you actually comprehended. What did it say? This actually is the, the S of our SOAP uh, scripture reading plan. Scripture, what is it saying? Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. This is the, the S of like, 
did I comprehend what I just read or was I just reading words? And until you know what it actually says, you can't actually, be, you're not able to regurgitate it. So you, you, there's no way you could even go to the next level, which is to interpret what does it mean? You first have to comprehend what did it say so that you can interpret what does it mean. And you can only do that once you figure out what it says. And context, can I tell you, context is integral to this process. So that's, that's the observation part of our scripture reading. What does it mean? I'm observing what does this actually mean so that I can ask myself, how does this apply to me? What is the application? How does God want to use this to change me? <laughs> so we've got we've to know what it says. We've got to know what it means so that we can know how God wants to use it to change us. And then the last part of our, our process and our soap plan is now we just pray, oh God, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom and lead me into all truth. So I, I think it's important for us to know. Um, I'm, I, want, I want you to know how to study scripture. I don't want you to show up here on Sunday and go, boy, I hope you got enough time to do some good work this week. And I never think about engaging with scripture until he gets up there again. It's, it's not enough to just know what it says and know what it means if you're not going to apply it. So when a medicine is applied to an affected or infected area, it, when it's applied, it brings change. And I don't know if you ever know this, but scripture is medicine to infected areas of our lives, and we need to apply it to our lives on a daily basis. It's our understanding first, though, of who God is that I gain understanding on who I am. So we lead with, what does this passage teach me about, not about me, what does it teach me about God? Once that is revealed and understood, how does this aspect of God's nature that I've just learned, how does that change my view of me now? Because I don't know me unless I know him. And then beyond that, what do I do in response? To answer those questions, what, what we do know before we dive into this is that what we're getting ready to read was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was, it was, it was used through people, but it was authored by the Holy Spirit. And we want to read the envelope, and we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to read the whole thing, and we're going to find out what does it mean for us today. So before we jump in, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, this is for us today. This is for, come on, turn to somebody and say, this is for us. Maybe turn to your second choice and say, this is definitely for you. This is definitely for, <laughs> I don't know. Definitely for you. All right. Are you guys ready for us, Peter? Are you guys ready for this book study? First Peter chapter one, verse one, and it starts right here. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So who's the letter from? It's from, you're like, man, this scripture interpretation thing is easy. I mean, this is the way it's gonna be. And you might have guessed even from the title of the book who had written it. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter, a man of great faith, of great passion, loud, boisterous, outspoken. He's the one that jumps out of the boat, walks on the water, and then he realizes what he's done, and he goes, oh my goodness. And I love that about Peter because I can relate to that. Anybody ever done something and then afterwards thought, oh, what did I just do? Anyone ever? do? I can relate to Peter. Peter, but yet at the same time, he was sensitive to the voice of the Spirit of God, when Jesus says, who do they say that I am? It was Peter that spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He was passionate, filled with faith. And, and then just a little, literally like a paragraph later from that experience, Jesus is like telling him to get behind him because he's Satan. This is Peter's life. I mean, it's like one, on one hand, he's like, you are the Christ, the living God. I'm Satan. What is going on? Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, Peter goes crazy. He sees these three figures illuminated. He experiences the glory of God. And he says, this is a man. I've got a great idea. Why don't, Elijah, let's put up some tents here and let's just live here. To which God speaks from heaven and goes, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. In other words, Peter, listen to him. So I, I can relate to that because every now and then God has to remind me, don't get ahead of what I'm trying to do. 
You're not in charge. You just, this is my son. Listen to him. Peter's so relatable, and I think we'll see all kinds of relatable moments in, in his letter. We see moments where he overreacts, where his emotions get the best of him, and he flees at the first sight of trouble, and he denies Jesus, and Jesus even told him he would do it, and he ends up being restored. Does anyone find hope and solace in the restoration of Peter? I mean, I, when I read this story and I go, how does Jesus let him back in after he does that? But at the same time, I don't know about you, I'm like, well, thank God he does because now if he let him back in, maybe he can let me back in. Um, this is the guy that's writing this letter. He, he's a man who ends up being martyred for his faith. But we get to see the trajectory of a man's life. We get to see him move from one place to another with many bumps along the way, but he's gradually becoming something more, something different. This is my story. This is your story. We're, we're all on this journey together, bumps and bruises and all, and, and God is trying to move us to something more, to something different. I was thinking yesterday, what was it like What's it like for Peter, who's now in heaven, to have his entire life laid out for all to read? I mean, even unchurched non-believers know about Peter. Like, oh yeah, the guy that cut that guy's ear off. I know about him. Oh, the walking on water guy. Yeah, I know him. I mean, the shortcomings, the denial, the lack of faith, his temper, his inability to think before he speaks. I mean, we, we have record of everything he did wrong. What's that like for every person to have access to every shortcoming and misstep you've ever taken? I mean, for it to be captured and recorded for all of time. I, I was thinking, can you imagine someone following you around all day, every day, making note of every conversation, every interaction, every comment, every remark? Every stupid thing you do, every time you overstep, every time you don't think before you speak, every time you deny Christ by putting your needs ahead of him. I mean, what if someone was following you around all day and capturing it, and then by the sovereignty of God, it was put in the most read, most studied book of all humanity? I mean, any volunteers? I mean, Peter knows this. I mean, he knows that people know about his life. And so there are times when he has to come from that angle and address those things in this letter that he's written. So right from the beginning, he actually takes this posture of humility by simply stating, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone who is called directly by Jesus and declared the message of the gospel, being empowered and equipped by Christ. So uh, you and I are disciples, but uh, we're not apostles in that sense. Because uh, Jesus hasn't appeared to me personally and called me. and uh, Maybe he has for you, but hasn't for me. But I think it's really interesting what, what he doesn't say. Uh, he doesn't say, uh, you know who I am. This is from Peter, probably the chief apostle, um, from my humble opinion. I mean, I wasn't just one of the 12. I was in the three. And they always list me first, Peter, James, and John. And... Uh, so I get to see more of Christ than you ever will, and I'm, kind of, I'm just kind of a big deal. No, he, he doesn't overstate his role. And if anyone at this time had justification to do that, it was Peter. I mean, honestly, at this time in church history, Peter would have been so revered, so respected as someone who was an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, but instead he just leads with, yes, I, was, I just love the fact that he's able to claim that now. And maybe that, was, maybe that was what was enough for him too. And then he goes on to say who he's writing this letter to in the rest of verse one. He says, to those who are elect exiles, we'll come back to those two words, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter's writing this letter towards the end of his life. He's writing it about 64 AD. He was martyred around 67, 68 AD. So this is just a couple years before he's, he's killed. You may not know this, Peter was also married. His wife would join him on his missionary travels. Tradition tells us she was also martyred for the cause of Christ. And this letter was written while he was in Rome. At the time, Nero was the emperor of Rome. 
He was crazy. I don't know if you know your history, the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. He actually, most believe, he actually started the, the fire that destroyed the city that he was the emperor of. Because he wanted to create a completely different city. And he, he blames it on the Christians. So that now he can press more, more firmly into persecuting these Christians. And it becomes what was already a challenging time for them. The persecution intensifies. And, and he was known to dip Christians in tar and burn them alive. And they would become the lights for his parties. I mean, so he, this guy is he's in a whole other level. This results in this dispersion uh, of believers uh, that they disperse under the persecution and they start to form these small congregations around this area. This is uh, what is now modern day Turkey uh, on the south side of the Black Sea is where all of these are located. And it's kind of interesting. It's all in a kind of a circle. You see how it kind of made the rounds. It's about 1,500 miles. This letter would have traveled about 1,500 miles from Rome to these believers that have been dispersed. And in, in short, his letter was to encourage these believers that were so persecuted. And again, because of his role of the birth of the church and the growth of the church, his, his, his perspective was so revered. This letter carried so much weight and significance for these believers. And Peter refers to them as elect exiles. They're not only elect, but they're exiles. Elect meaning that they're chosen. But, but they aren't yet fully formed in their truth at this time. It's like when we would say, um, she is the elect bride of this person. Okay, now, if you're the elect bride, are, are you yet married? No, but you certainly will be married, but you are the elect bride. And similarly, we are the elect bride of Christ in this way and and there are things within our journey that we have not yet experienced and yet we are fully the bride of Christ currently and throughout this letter Paul or Peter will reiterate this idea that we have this present truth that we are aware of and yet we have a future truth that we will experience we are chosen we are the elect bride of Christ and then he refers to them as exiles another translation calls them scattered foreigners now, the reality is not everyone that he was writing to were foreigners in these lands. Some of them were, were natives in these lands as well. So you have this mixture of people that were dispersed and scattered, and you have natives, and he's writing this letter to them. But beyond just the, the meaning of scattered foreigners, thought he, the fuller meaning of what he's trying to convey here is that they, they've been called to a way of life that is going to make them look radically different than the world around them. They are exiles. They are foreigners, which is going to get them treated differently. So I want us to understand we are exiles. In, in the fullest meaning of what he's trying to convey here, we are called to live in such a way that looks radically different than the world around us. We are called to be obviously different to the degree that we will be treated as exiles which is why we don't like being radically different because we don't want to be treated differently. We actually don't want to stick out. How different does your life look from the world? I mean, in your relationships, in, in the way you spend money, and where you invest your time and your energy, what you pursue, um, you guys know that Ashley and I were traveling last week. I, I love to people watch. I love to observe people. And anytime you're sitting in an airport, it gets a great opportunity to just see wonderful things that you just can't believe you're seeing with your own eyes. Um, we were waiting on our, uh, to board our flight there in Florida and uh, we're coming home and uh, we were dressed, it was 80 and sunny there. And so we were dressed in Florida type clothing to head home and and yet, but we, we saw people coming through the airport wearing full-length coats and hats and gloves and scarves and sweaters. And you could look around and you just go, he's not from here. Based on what he's wearing, what he's doing, how he's talking. And this is a little bit of the picture Peter's trying to get us to grasp. We should look like we don't fit in. The problem is we fit in way too comfortably. 
If someone followed you around today, tomorrow, at the end of the day, would their takeaway be, you know what? God really matters to them. Their relationship with God really matters. I mean, would they say that God's not just on your list, but he's at the top of your list? I mean, if someone saw you and how you treated others and how you interacted with others and the words you spoke of others, would they say, you know what, that's, that's honoring of God? Because the truth is, every one of us is going to stand before Almighty God, the creator of the universe, and the first, this may blow your mind, the first question he's going to ask you is not going to be, how was your church attendance? What denomination were you affiliated with? Did you sign the card? Did you say the right thing before you were baptized? That's actually not the thing he's going to ask you. What he's going to ask you is, what did you do with my relationship with you? What did you do with my son, Jesus? That's what he's going to ask us all. And if someone were to follow you around, would they say, that really matters to them? Because all of the things we could put our time and our energy and our effort and our finances and our thoughts and our love and our passion into, it's that that causes us to act differently, talk differently, dress differently, date differently. We are elect exiles. We are the elect chosen ones, the bride of Christ to come. And we are exiled. We are set apart in such a way that the world should look at us and say, there's some, they're not from here. So it's written by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, a couple years before he's martyred and he's writing to these persecuted believers in what is now modern day Turkey. Now we're in verse two. This is why we never know how long book studies are going to take us, everybody. According to the foreknowledge, watch what Peter does here. Watch this. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. You see what he does here? He's, he's actually teaching these young persecuted believers in the triune nature of God. We're called, we're chosen, we're elect exiles according to these things. The foreknowledge of God. So God foreknew us before the foundation of the world in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ for sprinkling of his blood. Foreknown by God the Father, sanctified by the spirit, which makes us obedient to Jesus Christ. Peter gives us a clear role uh, of the Trinity. The Father initiates the plan of salvation by sending his son. Jesus was described as the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. So the father initiates the plan of salvation, but the son accomplishes the plan of salvation. He lives a perfect life. He goes to the cross. He takes on our sin so that we can take on his righteousness. And he does what we couldn't do in our sinful state, what we couldn't atone for. And then he's resurrected back to life on the third day and he accomplishes the plan that the Father initiated. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit then applies our salvation. Meaning, Jesus, before he left, said, I'm going away, but I'm sending a helper and it's better for you that you have the Holy Spirit. What's the role of the person of the Holy Spirit? To speak truth into our innermost being, to encourage us, to lead us into all truth, not exclusively, but primarily through God's word. Because wherever God's word goes, his Holy Spirit accompanies it. And he speaks to our mind and he reveals truth to us. And then he empowers us to live this overcoming abundant life because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now resides inside of us. The Holy Spirit applies this work of salvation to our lives. Am I preaching to anybody yet this morning? Is it, we're in verse two. We're in verse two. There's five chapters. And the father initiates and the son accomplishes and the Holy Spirit applies. Peter lays this out for us before we even get to verse 2. Now watch what he says. And for the sprinkling with his blood. We're called through salvation to obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. Peter's actually referencing a couple of Old Testament references. Numbers 19, Exodus 24. If you remember, if you're familiar with the Exodus story, 
It's really about the birth, the rebirth of a nation that was in bondage to the Egyptians for hundreds of years. God raises up a leader, Moses, who becomes the deliverer. He leads them out of Egypt, out of the bondage from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He crosses the Red Sea, and they come to Mount Sinai, where God gives Moses the law, the Ten Commandments. And then look what it says in Exodus 24, verse 4. And when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, look, watch how they respond. Everything the Lord has said, we will do it. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the story about the Israelites, but that doesn't happen. Um, nor, by the way, does it happen in our lives. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said, and he got up early the next morning, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and he set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. It says this now. Verse 5, and then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Verse 6, and Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Verse 7, and then he took the book of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, all that the Lord had said, and he read it to the people and they responded, got it, got it, got all that. I love their optimism. A for effort. Problem is, we know the rest of the story and we know the story of our own lives. Do we obey everything the Lord has told us to do? No. Look what Moses does in verse eight. Watch this. And then he took the blood and he sprinkled it. Look at the, look at the verbiage. Peter knew the Old Testament. He sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with with all that had been written down. Why does he sprinkle blood on the people? Because he knows that they will not and cannot be perfect and obedient and do everything that the Lord has said. And the blood becomes the covering for them and the covenant can then remain intact. You and I, we, we should want to want to obey God's law. And we should want to obey it not just because we're fearful for punishment, no, because the Bible says there, there's therefore no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus on the Passover, he says, this cup is the, it's the new covenant. My blood is the new covenant because you're gonna need it on the days when you don't get it right and it's gonna keep the covenant intact. But we should love to obey the law of God. Why? Because the law tells us things that are true about God. We should want to be people of truth because we worship a God who is truth. We should want to be people who have faithfulness in our relationships because we serve a God who is faithfulness. Our lives become a representation of his nature. This is a story about God, not about us. But as we learn about him, we learn about us and we change the way we live. The law illustrates the nature and character of God and we should love to obey the law because we love the God that it represents and because it makes us more like him. And that's a good place to say amen men right there. We should love it. That's why David said, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it. I love it. It's this joyful obedience out of gratitude for the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's not this begrudging obedience out of fear. How, how is that possible? Because there is joy in seeking to obey but there's also freedom provided through the blood of Jesus when we don't get it right. And it keeps the covenant intact. Anyone else thankful for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus this morning, everybody? It keeps the covenant intact. That's what Peter's saying to us. Now, what it doesn't mean is that we cheapen God's grace and take advantage of Christ's work on the cross by intentionally breaking the law, knowing that the sprinkling is waiting for us. That's not what he's saying. That's why one of the other apostles, John, says this in 1 John chapter 2, and we can be sure that we know, that's not know here, it's know here. We can be sure that we know, because we're in relationship with him. We know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. I just wish the Bible were more clear sometimes. 
verse five. Now look what it goes on to say. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. So we obey out of our love for him and our obedience understands, we now understand the character and nature of God and we become more like him in our obedience to him. That is how we know we are living in him. And hmm, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Boy, is that, okay, well, that's a standard. And we know we're going to need the sprinkling of the blood of Christ in those moments when we don't live as Christ did and he keeps the covenant intact. This is the idea that Peter's bringing to us when we follow in obedience to Christ, when we strive to live our lives as Christ did. We, we won't look like everyone else around us. We will look like strangers sometimes. And we've got to get okay looking like strangers sometimes. Now look what it says now in the rest of verse 2. It says, so may grace and peace be multiplied to you. I love what Peter does here because he actually bridges a gap and he uses two greetings for two different cultures. Grace be multiplied to you was the traditional Greek Gentile greeting. And he's intentionally wanting his non-Jewish readers to engage because again, it's sent to this dispersion of converts that are coming from all these different backgrounds, but he also includes the traditional Hebrew greeting of peace, shalom. And what he's saying is, I see all of you, and I know that you're from all over the place, but in Christ, under the umbrella of Christ, we are, there is neither no Jew nor Gentile. We're all under the same umbrella. So we're, we're now past the greeting. He has said hello to us. Hello, everybody. Verse three, here we go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here he's intentionally again using a familiar phrase of what would be used in a traditional Jewish worship gathering. They usually would start with a blessing of either the name of God or of God the Father. But what he does is he connects him immediately to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he doesn't just bless God the Father, he immediately connects. Again, he's teaching them the triune nature of God. But right now he's talking about God the Father. And so now he's going to expound on what he laid out in verse 1 and 2. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So now what he says here in verse 3, watch this. According to his great mercy, God the Father, he's talking of, he, God the Father, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4. To an inheritance, here's what you're going to notice about verse Peter. Um, he, he writes the longest sentences ever. He likes commas. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, comma, verse five, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, now we're going to go down and break. How many of you are glad we're going to go back and break that down a little bit, okay? Um, he's talking about God the Father, and he says he's caused us to be born again because God the Father initiates the plan of salvation. It's not something that, that is yet to happen or, or is happening right now, but he's, it's actually already happened. He initiated the plan of salvation and God the Father caused us to be born again. So is this something that's going to happen or has already happened? It's already happened. He caused us. He's referencing the same born again reference that Jesus used with Nicodemus. How, how, how do I do this? You must be born again. And God initiates, God the Father initiates that process by sending his son. It's in that moment when someone invites Christ into their life and makes him the Lord of their life. It's in that moment that we receive forgiveness of every sin, past, present, and future. It's in that moment that our salvation is come due to repentance. So here's the, here's the first point we're learning today out of First Peter. Because of that, because of God initiating and because we can experience that salvation, here's the first thing. We're freed from the penalty of sin. Now, now if you really understood what that just said, you would have said, thank God I'm free from the penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Death. And not physical death, but spiritual death. By that, I mean separation from, from God. Romans 6 tells us the wages, the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God who initiates this plan of salvation by sending his son provides eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what Peter's talking about 
here in this passage, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. What have we born, been born again to? Watch this now, verse three. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a, come on, say these words out, to a living hope. Okay, I love this phrase. It's one of the reasons we made it the tagline of the series. We sang about it earlier it's a living hope. I love the fact that he attaches the word living to our hope. We are not born again to a false hope or a dead hope or a misplaced hope or a partial hope. We're born again to a living hope, nor are we born again to hopelessness in any form. I think this is really important for us to understand because when I see my news feed and when I see what everyone's commenting on and when I see everyone's commentary on what's happening in the world and when I listen to the world's commentary, it's easy, if I'm not careful, even when I listen to Christians' commentary, it's just all going to hell in a handbasket. I guess we just, it's all going down. Hey, we're the people called to hope, everybody. And not just hope, but a living hope. Not a dead hope or a false hope or a scared hope. Not a wishful hope. We're born again to a living hope. We have a hope, but our hope's not grounded just in this time. We have a future hope that we're looking towards. Titus called it a blessed hope. But I just want to remind us today, it's not fitting for the people of God, those who have been redeemed, to live from this place of the penalty of sin. We've been set free from the penalty and the curse of sin. We don't have to be hopeless. We're called to a complete living hope. What is, why, why is it living? Well, it's living because the one who secured it for us is alive. <laughs> and we get, to, we get to enjoy the benefit of the living God we serve. The one upon which our hope rests is alive, who freed us from the penalty of sin. He's living. I love this quote. From Warren Wearsby, he says, this hope is not a sedative. It's a shot of adrenaline, a blood transfusion, like an anchor, Hebrews 6. Our hope in Christ stabilizes us in the storms of life. But unlike an anchor, our hope moves us forward. It does not hold us back. It is a living, alive hope that we live in, everybody. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse four now of 1 Peter chapter one. Two, what is it calling us to? To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What is our inheritance? It's salvation and eternity with God. So we're no longer laboring under the penalty of sin. We're no longer dead to sin, but we are alive in Christ. And then Peter gives us four descriptors of our inheritance. He says it is imperishable, meaning it cannot die. It is not subject to decay. It is undefiled, meaning it is completely pure, without spot. It cannot spoil. It is unfading, which means it is eternal. It cannot disappear, and it's kept in heaven for you, meaning it is absolutely safe and and secure being held for you specifically. That's what he's called us to. Do you, do you hear the Sermon on the Mount in here? A sermon that Peter would have sat at the feet of Jesus and heard it come off of his lips. We don't, we don't store treasures where things rust. Where thieves can break in and steal them, Matthew chapter 6 says. We don't store treasures there. But it goes on to say in verse 20, we store our treasures in heaven, in an eternal space. Why? Because everything that's here is perishable, defiled, fading, and it stays here. It's not going with you. That's why David wrote in Psalm 16, you, you alone, Lord, are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. It's, he's saving it for you. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. Romans chapter eight, Paul would reiterate the same thought and he would say this in Romans chapter eight. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies. How many are longing for this day to be released from sin and suffering? It's coming someday because he paid for the penalty of sin. Okay, it goes on to say this now. And we too wait with eager hope 
for the day when God will give us our inheritance, our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies. He's, anybody looking forward to the new body, everybody? I'm much buffer in heaven, I promise you. And then it goes on to say this. We were given this hope when we were saved. So that, that, that hope immediately happened. You have that hope, that, this living hope waiting for you. If we already have, uh, have something, why would we need to hope for it? And it goes on to say this in verse 25. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait for it patiently, but I love this word, confidently. It's a future hope that all awaits those that have submitted their lives to Christ. Which maybe you're asking the question, how do you get an inheritance, by the way? What has to happen for you to get an inheritance? Well, someone has to die. And someone did die. But you would never, I would hope, you would never go to someone and say, man, I love that antique chest, that grandfather clock, that, that painting you got. Thank God they finally passed. Love your inheritance. I mean, we would never say that unless there was a way to get the inheritance and still have the person whose death brought it about living. Then you would rejoice and you would go, that inheritance is fantastic. That's why we can rejoice in our inheritance now because it came with a price. Someone did die, Jesus did, but the one who secured it is alive and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. We have a future hope. Verse five now, 1 Peter chapter one. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And maybe you're like, that is my life. That was my week. It's been my year. That's been my month. The salvation that's already happened though. Now, now he's speaking of a salvation yet to come. This is a future of your salvation. There is a future part of your salvation that's going to take place that we will be saved from something else, from not just the, the penalty of sin. Remember that we're the bride of Christ, the elect bride of Christ. We're, this is where we enter the presence of God and we're not now just free from the penalty of sin. Now we're free from the presence of sin. Can you imagine that? In other words... As long as we're here on this earth, we have to deal with sin. Sometimes we will be a part of it. And whether we want to be around sin or not, it's going to exist. But while we're here, we have a hope in a part of our salvation that removes the presence of sin. Just as our salvation, justification removes the penalty of sin, our glorification removes the presence of sin. So whether you die and go on to be with the Lord or whether the Lord returns before you pass, at that point, listen, sin no longer exists in your life. What a great day. Anybody looking forward to that day? No more sin. Romans chapter eight says this. Yet what we suffer now, look, is nothing. It's nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. Boy, don't the trials of life just not seem like it's a little while. I mean, I remember sitting in math class and thinking, this will never end. <laughs> Ever. And I would look at the clock on the wall. Time would slow down. I remember thinking, high school will never end. Ever. Ever. I'm thinking, man, I can't wait until I'm on my own. Make my own decisions. Make a fool of myself. <laughs> can't wait until I get married and have a career and have kids. Here we are. You know, it's, uh, it's funny how long we think things take. And our trials are nothing compared to the glory. 
that will be revealed to us. Encouragement here is that we can <laughs> rejoice in that our trials are ending. Not only are they temporary, but they have a purpose in them. Verse seven, watch what he says now. These have come, what have come? The trials have come so that, watch this, the proven, tested genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, that the proven, tested genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Did you know that trials prove the genuineness of your faith? Some people go through trials and they spend the rest of their life blaming God and blaming people. And it was actually a test to prove the genuineness of their faith. And the purpose of the trial is not only to prove that, but it's also to result in, it actually has nothing to do with you, but to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Praise, worship to God in the midst of the trial, glory. I don't just express praise, but I experience his presence. Honor, the elevation of God. I express, I experience, I elevate. And when those things happen, we recognize that something deeper is happening inside of us rather than just complaining about the trial. This is the crucible of life, everybody. God is honored and glorified in the way that his children handle adversity differently than the people that live in the world. So the worst moments of our lives are the premium opportunities to give praise, glory, and honor. Peter actually references Job here in 20, verse, chapter 23 of Job. He says, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. But think of Job's story in the middle of trial. And rather than being short-sighted, he said there's something deeper happening here. Peter says the same thing. Now he says this in verse eight. Watch this. Though you have not seen him. Now who's he talking about now? Okay, so he's moved now from God the Father to the Son, Jesus. Though you have not seen him, he's teaching these young believers that are being persecuted. He's teaching them the triune nature of God. Not seen him. You will love, you, you love him, even though you've not seen him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that it's inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is he talking about now? I, I can't help but, but think that Peter was remembering a conversation that Jesus had with Matthew. When he said, you, you believe because you've seen Blessed are those who believe and who have not seen. Peter heard Jesus say that to Matthew. And again, he's talking about our salvation, but he's now not talking about something that happened in the past, and he's not talking about something that's gonna happen in the future, but he's talking about living in the reality right now that we can live this life even though we haven't seen Jesus. <laughs> Spurgeon says this, he says, a little bit of your faith can take your soul to heaven. But a lot of faith can bring heaven to your soul. <laughs> and some of us, we need to invite heaven into our soul here. We've been freed from the penalty of sin and eventually we'll be freed from the presence of sin. But what Peter's talking about right now is that we can be freed from the power of sin right here, right now, before we even see him. This is biblical word, first time guest, sorry, New, new convert, this is just, here's the word, this is sanctification. It's a Bible word. What is that? It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us that literally changes the way we think, the way we behave, the things that we desire. Peter mentioned it at the beginning of, of the chapter, sanctification in the spirit, he said. 
So rather than being held under the, the power of our old desires that cause us to think and behave incorrectly, now we're given new desires and new thoughts that allow us to choose and behave in alignment with God's word. We have something working inside of us now, not perfectly, but increasingly. Oh, he's not looking for perfection. He's looking for pursuance. He's looking for a step. I don't know if you've ever had this thought where you go, boy, I'm still working on that. But when I look at where I was, I'm way better than I used to be. Thank you, Jesus. Which means that there's work to be done in us after we've been freed from the penalty of sin, now we have the process of being freed from the power of sin. This is sanctification. This is the will of God. First Thessalonians chapter four, it says, this is the will of God. What? Your sanctification. I just really would like to know God's will for my life. Okay, he not only wants to save you, he wants to change you. And that's his will. That's his will. It's God's will that you would go on the journey of allowing the Holy Spirit to do a transformative work inside of you, which is exactly what sanctification is. It's that process. It's the Holy Spirit pulling back the layers of our lives incrementally, one step at a time, bringing about holiness in our lives. It's why we're always talking about the next step here, because this is God's will for our lives, to take the next step. It's our refusal and our digging in the heel, and I'm not ready to do that, that you fight against the will of God in your life, actually. His will is that you would open yourself up to the process of not just being saved, but being changed and transformed, friend. That's his will. It's why we're always compelling you, take the next step. Step one. When's that? Today. Some of you are like, I don't need to do that. I know what church is. I know how they work. I know it. <laughs> and some of you just need to take a step. Because it's God's will for your life. That you have a process being worked out inside of you. That's moving you along this continuum of, of grace. Peter says that the outcome, the end result, is that we would grow in the process of sanctification. Boy, how encouraging this would be for these new believers, huh? Now, this is coming from someone who had seen Jesus. He had seen him and yet denies him. Now, have you ever had that thought like, boy, if I could just sit down with Jesus and have a conversation, everything would be better. Peter would say, probably not. Probably wouldn't. I mean, if anyone had any reason not to doubt to not lose heart, to not give up. It's this guy who puts his foot on the other side of the boat and walks to him. I mean, if anyone has any reason not to ever give up or lack faith, it's, it's Peter. And yet, like Jesus, Peter is commending to us, actually, you're better off because Jesus said, I'm sending a helper to you. And through the Holy Spirit, you will be equipped and empowered to grow in your faith, to grow in the process of sanctification. Now, verse 10, we're getting down to the end. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to come to you. Now, they're speaking of Jesus. The prophets prophesied, so Isaiah would write. And they would write these prophecies of the one who was to come. And they would search intently and with the greatest care, the prophets would write, inquiring. While they were writing, they would be going, who is this person? When is he coming? What time? And the spirit of Christ in them would indicate when he, that's capital H, the spirit predicted the sufferings of Christ. The Holy Spirit predicted the sufferings of Christ to them and they wrote it. And they wrote of the subsequent glories Come, okay, think about this. We have prophets that so longingly wanted to know, when is he coming? When will I see him? And they had limited access to scripture. And, and yet, by the sensitivity and leading of the Holy Spirit, they would write these 
prophecies, how he would come and how he would suffer. And he commends them for their diligence. And each prophet, although limited in what they had available to them, they would study with such care. And Jesus comes along hundreds of years later and they never get to see what they prophesied about. And Jesus comes along and he fulfills the prophecies and he tells his disciples how he's going to suffer. And the disciples knew the Old Testament. And so when Jesus starts telling them how he's going to suffer, they realize he's the fulfillment of it. That's why Peter freaked out. No, no. Because he knew. At the end of his life, Peter is trying to convey to these new believers, it's all there for us now. The, the, the whole story is available to us now. Verse 12, last verse of the day. And it was revealed to them, the prophets that were writing, that they were not serving themselves, that they weren't going to be able to experience the very thing they were prophesying about, but they were serving you and me. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by now the apostles who have preached the gospel to you because the Holy Spirit was in them. So now he's speaking of himself. He's speaking of what the apostles' role has been, preaching the good news. And now he's saying to these persecuted believers in Asia Minor, you have it all now. You're not trying to piece things together with portions of scriptures and bits and pieces of prophecy. You've seen the whole thing come full circle. You can put it all together now. So in other words, he's trying to say they should be encouraged because the prophets of old, whom they revered, only saw part of it and you've seen all of it you understand what it's all about now what Jesus came to accomplish what the gospel is trying to do and then he closes out this section of chapter 1 watch what he says here even angels long to look into these things this is an incredible thought I want you to catch this have you ever thought about this angels can't fully understand the gospel because they haven't sinned they can look and rejoice when the salvation that was anticipated and led by the father and accomplished by the son and applied by the holy spirit they can they can then Rejoice when it happens in our lives. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when that happens, but they have no firsthand understanding of what it means to be redeemed and set free from the penalty of sin. It's like a, it's like a blind person standing on the shoreline and someone's describing to them the sunset. And they can hear the, the waves lapping along the shoreline and they can hear the excitement in the person's voice as they describe the, the splendor and the colors of, of the sunset, but they can't fully grasp it. Likewise, the angels can hear and they can be excited about others experiencing the fullness of salvation. They can witness excitement over the gospel, but they cannot enter in the way that we can. They can't understand a truth that you and I can know in a very real way. Even angels long to look into the things that we experience and Peter encourages his readers. Do you understand that you possess a salvation that frees you from the penalty of sin, justification, and will eventually free you from the presence of sin, glorification, and right now frees you from the power of sin, sanctification, and you possess something that even angels long to experience. You and I are the very envy of angels. It's an amazing thought. And we have a living hope that comes from a living resurrected Christ with an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiable. It's pure and unfading, and it's being kept for us in heaven. And if you're thankful for Peter writing, everybody say amen. Amen. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we're so grateful for your word. 
it's alive, it's living, it's active, it, it cuts to our core and yet it encourages us and it allows us to see things that maybe have caused confusion and it allows us to release things that have become burdens and it allows us to recognize that you're accomplishing something way bigger than what we might be seeing. This morning, you're here. Like, man, that's a lot of Bible, Devin. I mean, it's, it's a lot to kind of ingest. And I just want us to focus on a couple, a couple elements of what Peter's written to us today. And that is, friend, today, you can be freed from the penalty of sin today. Today. Salvation, justification happens for you today. You can be freed from the penalty of sin by taking a step of submission. I don't like that word, I know. But you controlling it and you micromanaging it and You squeezing the life out of it is not getting you the result you need. And God initiates the plan and he sends his son who accomplishes it by laying his life down so that you can be freed from the penalty of sin and you can take on the righteousness of God through his son, Jesus. You say, Devin, oh... Really for me? Yeah, for you. And he would do it just for you. If you're here today and say, I want to be free. I want to be free from just trying to keep the rules straight and just living out of fear. But I want to be set free from the past, present, sin to come under the blood, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That's you today. I want to be free from the penalty of sin. That's you. Yes. Yes. Don't be shy. Yes. Yes. God bless you. Thank you, God. Yes. Thank you. Free. He and the sun sets free. You're freed from the penalty of sin. It's no longer yours to carry. And right there where you're sitting, would you just say, God, I give you my sin. Your son paid for it. He accomplished all that needs to be accomplished. No punishment has to be done. He's accomplished it all. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. I receive the freedom. I receive the grace. It's it's just, it's free. It's a free gift to you, friend. You don't have to earn it. There's nothing you have to do. It's free. So just, Lord, thank you. Come come on, just say, Lord, I I thank you that you are now the leader of my life. I thank you now that I'm, I'm letting you be in control. I trust you with my life. Then really quickly, I just want to close with this thought because I think there are people here that that understand you've been freed from the penalty of sin and you understand that someday you'll be freed from the presence of sin. But as it currently stands right now, you're living in bondage to sin. And you, by the work of sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you can be freed. Listen to me. You can be freed from the power of sin. And God can break that stronghold that's been over your life for years, friend. And I want us to be... to be an honest church this morning. I want us to say, yeah, I've given my life to Jesus and yeah, I'm going to heaven. Penalties taken care of, presence taken care of, but I want the power of sin broken on my life today. And if that's you this morning, I want you to raise your hand. You may even want to stand and say, break the power of sin by the power of the Holy Spirit that's sanctifying me, that's refining me, that's transforming me. Come on, all across this place. Come on, let's stand. Let's lift our hands and say, you set me you're the living hope. You died. You rose again. I'm being sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. Come on, let's sing.